Join Finastra for its global hackathon and be part of the movement. Welcome to Hack to the Future 4. Connect with our global community to learn about decentralized finance. Discover how to build a better future with sustainable and inclusive finance. And learn how to scale up with banking as a service and embedded finance. Win prizes from Finastra and our partners to help you continue your fintech journey. Register now at fintech.devpost.com. Bonjour à tous and thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, I'm Christophe Langlois. I'm the Global Head of Fintech Marketing at Finastra. We are welcoming you to another live conversation as part of our Thought Leadership content series during the fourth edition of our global fintech hackathon called Hack to the Future. Over and beyond being a hackathon, Hack to the Future is a movement igniting a world of financial sustainability, inclusion and empowerment. So building on the success of our previous hackathons to redefine finance for good and build an unbiased fintech future, we continue to use our position in the market to inspire the fintech space to be open by default for everyone. And this year, we aim to drive engagement um, beyond our global fintech ecosystem with three key themes, which are all inclusive and open to all. One is US ESG, sorry. Two is embedded finance. And the third one is decentralized finance. So our Canton series is meant to inspire our hackers and anybody interested in these essential themes. And we hosted over 20 live sessions this year, which is a record for us. As usual, we're keen to make these conversations as engaging as possible. So if you're watching live, I invite you to ask your questions on LinkedIn and or YouTube. Uh, as a host, I'll make sure to go through them and uh, ask your questions to our um, excellent speakers today. And today we'll be talking about an incredibly important topic, the topic of financial inclusion. So just a quick overview, we, we, uh, lots of us are familiar with those uh, stats. Over 1.6 billion adults are in banks, according to the World Bank, that's globally. Yet, two-thirds of them have got access to a mobile phone. Even in the US, 63 million uh, people are in banks. In the UK, we're more than 1 million, so those are big numbers, of course. Uh, and there's also a difference as well. If you're from a BAME background, you have much more chances to be unbanked in the UK than if you're from a UK background. But then it's more than that. Living in a cashless society has impact. And again, just in the UK, 10 million Brits would struggle to, uh, to operate and to live in a cashless society. And it's not just individuals, it's also, of course, the micro, small and medium enterprises uh, which are impacted by um, those notions. So anyway, we could speak for days about those topics, but we don't have days today. We probably have 40, uh, 45 minutes. Um, we've got three, uh, two actually amazing speakers. So we're delighted and they're coming for two, from two esteemed clients at Finastra. They both bring like a very complimentary uh, sets of expertise and geographical coverage as well on the topic of financial inclusion and beyond. So my and our first guest, Sandra, so Sandra Hodendal, uh, the VP of uh, and Global Head of Sustainability at Scotia Bank. Um, where are you doing, um, Sandra? I'll give you a chance to, uh, to tell us more, but I believe before that that uh, <laughs> you practice uh, karate, so I need to be very careful <laughs> of what I'm saying today. Uh, and you've got an advanced, advanced, sorry, brown belt. So uh, how is it going with your black belt? Maybe you're going to tell us at the end, but now the mic is yours. Could you please tell us more about yourself? <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for hosting this and thanks for inviting uh, Scotiabank um, to join this panel. Um, yes, I do have uh, an advanced brown belt. It's uh, somewhat stalled during the pandemic. Um, I didn't enjoy practicing karate on Zoom from, uh, you know, from uh, either the living room or the bedroom. So uh, mostly uh, I didn't do anything for two years. And as a result, uh, and you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not 20 anymore. Uh, going back to karate means that I am always very sore. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's all. It's all good. It's uh, it's lots of fun, and uh, eventually I will have my black belt. Hopefully within the next year. 
Um, so yes, I lead the global sustainability team uh, at Scotiabank. So my team's responsible for um, the enterprise-wide strategies and programs for uh, corporate sustainability, climate change, and um, human rights and, and social impact issues. Um, and the team also um, covers the bank's ESG reporting. Um, I, um, I basically, uh, I'll just say a few words. Um, I joined the bank about two and a half years ago. Um, and I originally uh, was working actually for the bank for a year or so before that. Uh, as advising on their climate change strategy. Um, my background is actually in environmental science, uh, corporate sustainability and responsible finance. And um, I've done, um, I've worked at a, a few different banks um, and I've had the privilege really for you know more than 20 years now, most of my career in finance has very much focused on uh, environmental and social issues and how to integrate them into the business, into risk management um, and into the DNA of the bank. So um, it's great to see um, how much that perspective has, you know, ramped up and is very pervasive in the way that we expect businesses to operate now. Um, yep. So in terms, yeah, and I just want to say one more thing about Scotiabank, if I may. Um, sure. the, the interesting thing about Scotiabank is um, um, well, it is the third largest bank in Canada. We have about 90,000 staff, um, uh, at least two thirds in Canada, but followed by the U.S. and Latin America. So we're, um, we're very um, involved in the Pacific Alliance countries of Mexico, Colombia, Peru and Chile. Um, Scotiabank is, uh, you know, a, a large uh, integrated financial services company. So um, personal and commercial banking, wealth management, private banking, corporate and investment banking, capital markets, etc. cetera. Um, and our signature um, social impact area of focus, uh, which we launched last year formally, is, um, is around economic resilience. And so last year we launched our uh, Scotia Rise 10-year commitment to economic resilience. And that's anchored by a community investment program um, of $500 million in community investments over the next 10 years. But it also, uh, that idea that we wanna help drive economic resilience is also um, finding its way into a growing array of products, services, uh, and advice. Um, and, and in the way that we look at our own workplace and operations. So um, I know that we're gonna talk more about that um, through the course of this discussion. So thank you. Uh, we will, of course, hear the topics of uh, leadership and commitment and uh, and purpose as well. So, and all those topics, ESG, uh, uh, climate, and are of course extremely important. And we could spend at least at least a few hours on every single one of those topics. So, thank you very much, Sandra. Merci beaucoup. We should have done it in French, but that's for next time. It would have been uh, a lot shorter <laughs> <laughs> for me. <laughs> well. Uh, we'll test that. We'll put that to the test next time. Um, the second uh, guest, equally brilliant, so coming this time from France. So we've got Laurence Bourgeois. Uh, you're the financial inclusion uh, stream leader, I believe, at BNP Paribas Personal Finance. You've got a, a deep expertise in financial services, uh, 10 plus years in the BNP Paribas Personal Finance uh, group as well. Um, so again, we can't wait to, uh, to listen to you in the next few minutes. What is your martial art of choice? That's my first question. And then, of course, feel free uh, to tell us more about you, your role at BNP Paribas Personal Finance. You're on mute, you're on mute, maybe. Yes. Sorry, but I don't know anything about martial art. So <laughs> <laughs> one thing to, to explore, uh, probably, uh, I'm uh, more focused on theater, uh, which is perhaps more Parisian as well. But uh, <laughs> equally interesting, equally interesting. Yes. <laughs> yes, <it's> <laughs> OK, so uh, as you mentioned, long experience, so 25 years already uh, experience in the, in the banking sector, uh, in retail banking and consumer finance. Uh, I started on the field in Belgium as a branch manager, and then I pursued my career in corporate functions, uh, always in an international uh, environment. Uh, and I worked uh, also, I had a, a transversal journey within the bank because uh, 
I worked in M&A, finance, marketing, risk. And finally, very happy to work uh, since one year and a half uh, as a financial inclusion stream leader, as you, as you mentioned, for uh, BNP Paribas Personal Finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps a word about mm -hmm. BNP Paribas Personal Finance, uh, which is a subsidiary of BNP Paribas, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, we are present uh, in more than 30 countries and we are the uh, European leader uh, in consumer finance. Uh, we are providing credit to uh, individuals and uh, through partnerships with uh, retailers, uh, car dealers, uh, and, and also in, in B2C. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the heads up and the highlights. Uh, indeed, and uh, that's why we're very excited and we're still very excited with this uh, panel. Uh, first of all, I should also say that we were supposed to have a third guest from the Middle East to kind of add that element as well, the Middle East uh, region. Uh, another person who is a proficient in martial arts, believe me or not, he's got a black belt of Taekwondo. That would have been an interesting uh, gentle fight between the, between guests uh, he couldn't make it so sorry we just uh, it's going to be the three of us today but Hemant if you listen to us uh, we will miss you and we'll miss your insights today uh, in terms of uh, conversation there's so much to cover what I suggest uh, and there's a lot of uh, fundamental um, areas we need to cover to enable financial inclusion right and I thought we would start with one of the most important ones uh, which is still a key challenge, is the challenge of driving financial education, right? A challenge because it's universal, it's not for any specific market segment. Pretty much everybody still need it, um, from individuals to potentially uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, but not only for that, but because, because uh, it's also April, April is also, sorry, Financial Literacy Month, so I thought that was a good way to start the conversation. If we start with you, Laurence, um, and we talk about one specific segment, like the youth um, segment, I, I believe that recently you, uh, you conducted a um, survey, a report, uh, for, with, I think, 5,000 um, like young people uh, from five or six European countries. So would you mind sharing, maybe uh, starting to share some of those insights, starting with the focus on um, do they want credits? Uh, do they want to and do they dare, you know, um, asking for a credit uh, or do they don't know, or don't they know, you know, what to expect and yet that will impact their propensity uh, to deal with an organization like yourself. So I guess financial literacy, is it needed with the youth market? Please share some of those insights from your report. Yes, indeed. So financial literacy, uh, of course, it's extremely important. Right? So it's one of our uh, commitment as well uh, from, from BNP Paribas Personal Finance. And we are active in, uh, in uh, financial literacy as well as uh, uh, digital inclusion in what uh, we are doing with, uh, with the society. Uh, financial literacy for the kids. But when coming back to the survey that we did, indeed, that was in six European uh, countries, and we interviewed uh, young adults. It was uh, people aged between 18 and 30. And um, what, we, what we see is that uh, they have generally a negative image uh, of bank, and they have a lack of uh, financial, uh, financial knowledge. So when they talk about financing their plans, uh, they think about bank and financial institution to find information. That's, that's a good thing. So if I can give some figures, so 42% uh, of the young people do not consider to take a credit due to a lack of knowledge. 56% of them say they would go to financial experts or institutions to find information to finance their plan. 30% of the interviewees, which is uh, very interesting and also interesting in the partnership we could have with uh, the Chintex, for instance, uh, say that receiving advice about managing their budget is a priority they would expect from a credit institution. So there is a kind of legitimacy of, uh, of the banks and financial institutions that, in that domain. Uh, but to, to stay um, Correct. Uh, we must say also, uh, and we do not forget, that the most important for them uh, is that consumer credit 
to be more flexible and transparent in its cost. Flexible and transparent. Yes, so definitely uh, we think that we, we have a role to play uh, in uh, accompanying the young people uh, in managing their budget, uh, helping them to make uh, the good consumption choice and also prepare, prepare the future. And that was consistent actually all across those six countries? Yes, so of course there are some small differences, but this big message uh, was, uh, was relevant for whole countries. Yes. Interesting, yeah, interesting. No, thank you for sharing. And we'll go back to some of the notions from uh, that report uh, in a short while. Yes, Talking about. <laughs> thank you, Alance. Talking about, merci. Talking about uh, financial education or literacy um, and then switching from Europe, going maybe to North America uh, and Latin America as well. Um, Scotia Bank, um, Sandra, you obviously you are involved in a number of programs uh, driving financial literacy. It's one part of what the bank is doing. Could you please talk us more about some of those initiatives? So maybe not, let's go from youth to, I don't know, family, for instance, family finance. Could you please start there and give us a, a glimpse of uh, the scale of the challenge and what uh, the bank has been doing? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I agree. Financial literacy is such an important fundamentally... I think we um, lost your camera, sorry, your oh, feed, possibly. Oh. Sorry to interrupt. Ah, you're back. Is that working? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Apologies sorry. for interrupting. No, no, thank you for letting me know. I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, so the um, financial literacy is such an important thing to banks. Um, you know, in at Scotiabank, we have a number of different um, initiatives, and we, we tend to bucket this into um, the types of financial literacy that we would provide directly to customers. Um, and I can talk about a couple of those if you want later. And then the ones that we provide to anyone through community partnerships and community intermediaries. Um, so one of the ones that um, that's particularly interesting, um, certainly at least it is to me, is um, a program that we um, that we launched a few years ago with um, with a. a not-for-profit organization in Toronto called Wood Green, and it's the Scotiabank Family Finance Clinic. Um, and the Scotiabank Family Finance Clinic is for Toronto families, um, so it has to be at least one parent and one child under the age of 18 in their care, um, who families who live on a low income and um, who want to set up a financial plan and essentially um, they have the opportunity to have um, have uh, financial planning advice over the course of three months um, uh, with a, with a counselor supporting them uh, flexible scheduling and um, the idea is that and then during COVID it was done virtually um, and by telephone of course it's free and um, people can register year-round and basically um, they get uh, support on, you know, how to manage um, their family budgets, um, making sure they're accessing uh, all the government benefits that they're eligible for. Because it's always a surprise to me when you, when you hear how often um, funding that's available from, you know, different levels of government for families living on a low income, a lot of times they don't tap into it or they don't know about it, and the money goes unspent. Um, so yeah, so families are given, um, you know, financial literacy, confidence that they're, they know what they're talking about when they do go into the bank, they're going to be less intimidated, um, individual financial counseling so that they get advice on money management and, you know, um, places where they might be able to spend less, save more, spend differently, of course, and also, of course, increasing income. Um, so it's a number of different um, services, anything, you know, what you would expect from a good financial planner. But the, uh, the benefit of this is that it's um, the families are identified through the community partner, uh, Wood Green. And, you know, say people who've done the program feel a lot more confident that they're going to be able to figure their way out. Um, and the last piece is uh, managing debt, of course, which can be 
a challenge if you're um, if you're having um, financial challenges. So yeah. And these these families uh, initially they don't have to be a, a customer, or they no they, no no not anyway. Like so. It's open no, to anybody, I mean right? they, they might be, but it's open to yeah. anybody in the community, okay. and it's identified by the um, by the charitable partner. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about again. Uh, access to financial education or financial literacy over and beyond just the scope of the youth market uh, or families. Uh, let's talk about uh, entrepreneurs, maybe a wannabe entrepreneurs and maybe outside of Canada, but let's say, I don't know, let's say South America or Latin America. Uh, would you mind like sharing a, an example? Because I believe Scotia Bank is also very involved, maybe in Peru even, um, just to help people start a small business so yeah. if you could give us a gl glimpse of that that'd be interesting yeah of course thanks yeah so um so we also support uh, a program it's actually um delivered by plan international you know formerly known as foster parents plan um so plan international is this program with us in peru um and it's um I think it probably has a very elegant name in Spanish. Um, in English, it's Training Entrepreneurs of Tomorrow, which is still a good name. Um, and so the um, the idea is that um, it's to help um, to help young people um, uh, understand how to uh, so people between say 15 and 30 um, to understand what they can do to start their own business. Um, you know, also how to manage how to manage money again it's particularly if they're being entrepreneurial getting their own business off the ground how are they going to run the financial aspects of it how are they going to um, implement um, you know the uh, the structure around uh, around their business I mean the insight on that is that um, you know in Peru um, there are um, over 400,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 29 who are unemployed and um, and you know about eighteen percent of Peruvian youth in that age group are um, you know not in education, employment, or training. And um, so uh, you know in English it's neat, N E T. So you know it's really important to engage and show opportunities for um, to these young people uh, a sense of um, support for. Uh, launching their own initiatives um, because there's a lot of innovation, obviously, in young people and a, a lot of great ideas. And with the right uh, guidance, um, the right mentorship, um, the right um, the right skills and training, uh, they can actually have successful small businesses. And sometimes launching their own, sometimes in obviously in partnership with other people. Um, yeah, so much. that's that project, um, which we're it's a multi-year partnership with Plan. Uh, and that's great. And I, for one, would love to know more about it offline, at least, or yeah. go online to find out more. Actually, that's another uh, another option. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Uh, I'd like to explore that a bit more, the the tech side of things, innovation. But before, I mean, if we step back, uh, and I'd like to uh, involve Laurence again there. If we step back, um, a lot of the challenges we're facing, uh, sometimes the, the challenge of uh, being considered as a, the right financial partner could potentially be the lack of trust. So basically, the importance of building trust is extremely essential. And trust is at least two sides or two types of trust, right? One is the rational trust, trust as a trusted financial institutions with the right processes to, uh, to manage money, to make it secure and keep it and, and, and do the right thing to invest it. That's the rational one. The other one is the emotional one. Do I connect? Do I resonate with the brand? Uh, does that brand share the same values as me? Which, unarguably, is more and more important for, for the young people, the younger generation. They believe in uh, saving the planet, climate change, in ESG um, themes. So it's extremely important to focus on that. So talking about that, actually, and the importance of being genuine and committed and demonstrating it. Laurence. I believe you say that uh, the objective is to disrupt the current business model, to make it more inclusive, and to optimize the social impact of the BNP Paribas group. Uh, so you, could you please tell us more about that approach, how entrenched it is within your, your DNA, right? And uh, which kind of commitment comes from the very top of the organization? Yes, uh, actually, at Payette, we, uh, we are used to say that uh, 
financial inclusion is our is in our DNA. And at the very beginning, so uh, it was uh, 70 years ago uh, when the activity was launched in uh, in, in France. Uh, it was to finance the household equipment. Uh, so and at that time, a fridge it was worth uh, three months of salary. So it was really important uh, to get a credit. Uh, to get access to this uh, to this uh, household equipment, so at the very since the very beginning we are side by side uh, with the customer, and uh, and also we we commit a lot to a responsible credit, uh, which is uh, uh, the fact that we provide accurate information and we want to give support to to, to our customer, and so in the recent. More recent year, huh? so we, we are very proud now to have a, a new uh, raison d'être huh? that was uh, built in, in 2020. Uh, and, and this raison d'être is uh, promote access to more responsible and sustainable consumption to support our customers and our partners. And so that's very important. We are very proud of it. Uh, it's the reference framework of our 2025 plan. So it's really uh, embedded in our plan, followed closely by the management. Uh, the disruptive part also uh, is important. And uh, for instance, the financial inclusion stream uh, is one of the disruptive, disruptive streams we have together with circular economy, uh, energy transition, or, or, or mobility. So um, as you can see, it's very important that the, the purpose uh, combines the two dimensions, the social part and the uh, environmental uh, part. And um, we think at the end um, uh, that uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not only the richest that can change their, cons their consumption habits. Uh, so we, we are very happy that the richest can buy a, a Tesla, but we think it's not, it's not enough. So everybody has to change. And we want that as many people as possible uh, have access uh, to a more sustainable and responsible uh, consumption pattern. But that's really important. Yes. Um, so the purpose that's good have been real commitments that better. You know? So we have uh, seven commitments uh, that cover uh, three fields of action. Uh, the transformation of our business that we just discussed. Uh, the fact that we want to be uh, exemplary as a company and as an employer. It's important also for, um, for all the employees to believe in it. Huh? Uh, and we, do, we have to do our best to be exemplary as well. And uh, the third uh, field uh, of action is, uh, of course, the philanthropic uh, part. And, uh, and there we come back to... Um, to with the financial literacy and the digital inclusion I, I mentioned earlier, because we think that's really uh, our field of expertise uh, and where we can play a role in the society as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so there's a lot to come then more in terms of initiatives in the near future and the next few uh, months and years. Yes, to, but it's really good to, to see also the enthusiasm that uh, it uh, creates in, in, in the company, uh, in all the country, and people are are committed and uh, exciting to, to work on this topic. Uh, so, and I'm sure that uh, we do uh, or we do already a financial inclusion, and I'm sure that's a feel, uh, that's, it will that's be exciting. better with the new ideas that we have. Sure. Uh, and if we had time, actually, we could talk about the notions of uh, of that that purpose and communicating and being genuine about that purpose to not only, of course. Uh, help drive financial literacy and then, you know, educate the market and do something commendable or valuable at least, but also as well, um, attracting talent potentially, you know, that notion of wanting yeah. to work for a company which is committed. So that's yeah. another, um, mm -hmm. of course, I think value uh, of being genuine, of course, and not just faking um, that you're interested in those important topics. Uh, before I go back to you, Sandra, in a second, just wanted to say hi to a few people who commented. I mean, the comments, there's no real question about the topics, but uh, Mohamed, thank you, Adju, uh, Emilia, Ralid. Some of the questions are about, well, the main driver explaining the huge interest of young people into crypto assets. I think we're going to 
we're going to pack that one. Um, that's a bit more specific. Uh, we had other sessions talking about crypto, but um, if you don't mind, uh, Khalid, maybe offline or reach out, connect uh, directly on the likes of LinkedIn. Maybe we can find someone to, uh, to answer your question. Um, so, Sandra, so we talked about the importance of trust, right? Um, so I, I'm sure you might want to add something on that level of the, the governance and the leadership within Scotia Bank. So please feel free to start there. The other thing I'd like you to cover, if you don't mind, is the notion of, of trust. How do you get trust? You touched it before, potentially by partnering with the right set of intermediaries, mm -hmm. communities, trusted groups, and then with them building a way to then um, support those communities, which maybe would never have considered, you know, uh, talking to you uh, because of a lack of trust, not not because Scotia Bank, right, because financial services. So would you mind telling us more about that, um, that aspect, which is extremely important? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess um, one thing I would say is, um, and I don't have the stats right in front of me, but I'm, I'll try to dig them up. But in, in Canada, um, banks are generally actually fairly well trusted. Um, there, um, you know, the the uh, there's not very many um, large banks in Canada. They're um, they're extremely highly regulated, and um, the uh, there's generally a sense. A, you know, a general sense of trust with banks in Canada that um, I'm not sure if that's um, what the stats look like all around the world, but I just want to start with that. Of course, you have to earn the trust of uh, clients and the public every day, um, you know, by um, doing what you say, saying what you do, and, and choosing to do the right things. The, um, the benefit of uh, you know, having a number of uh, well-trusted community partners is, of course, is also making sure it gives us an ear to the ground and it also gives us a uh, conduit into communities where we may want to, um, you know, further bolster relationships in order to help support uh, our social impact um, objectives. So uh, there are a few examples of that. Um, you know, one of them, and I was thinking about it as we were talking about the uh, the ways of increasing financial inclusion and financial literacy in different communities. We talked about the um, the youth, talked a little bit about low income families, and um, and certainly young entrepreneurs. Another area where I think, you know, layering on the you know, the stability of, uh, you know, the bank with the community um, contacts of a partner is a partnership that we have with a group called Windmill Micro Lending in order to build, um, build the ability of newcomers to Canada who may know, you know, about what banks to use and may not be familiar with um, accessing financial services in, in this country. Um, we're working with um, Windmill Microlending, which is an organization that supports newcomer professionals to Canada. So, you know, new immigrants to Canada who need to get their professional accreditation recognized so that they can um, contribute to the economy at their, you know, at their highest potential. Um, so we, um, you know, in Canada, we recruit skilled immigrants, um, a lot of skilled immigrants. This is a country built on immigration, but we, when the labor market doesn't leverage their, um, you know, their skills and education that come from other countries, and there's really uh, the potential for a mismatch when in Canada we have labor gaps, uh, we need skilled people to do all sorts of uh, important things and yet the um, you know the people coming into the country um, you know they may not come in with the the capital to be able to um, you know spend the money to get their certifications maybe it takes a year to get your I'm making this up but your nursing or your accounting or whatever accreditation recognized here but you actually just need to you know have a job make money and put food on the table for your family. So an organization, 
Yeah, right. So an organization, um, what Windmill does is that they provide support to um, to new immigrants uh, and who might need micro. So they basically provide micro loans, and those micro loans at very competitive rates are provided so that the um, the new person, the newcomer to Canada, can actually they can use it for whatever they for. But the idea is they're using it in order to make sure they have the breathing room to spend the time um, and sometimes the fees to get their accreditation recognized here. Um, they have an incredible track record, uh, you know, so it's something like three or four times the income of the newcomer from the start of the program to the end usually goes up by at least three times. Unemployment drops from about 40% to less than 10%. Um, they have a 97% plus repayment rate of these microloans. We partnered with them about a year and a half ago um, with a $2.5 million multi-year partnership to support, in particular, the programs that they're providing for newcomer women. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, the challenges that are faced by um, by newcomers in general, in many cases are amplified for um, for female newcomers. And what they get is they get the mentoring, um, which Windmill provides to one to make sure that they're, you know, they know how to navigate like a completely new country and all the things they need to do to be recognized as a professional here, but career support, as, as I mentioned, the micro loans. And um, so, yeah, so we, we um, partnered with them and we're looking at, you know, over the course of three years, um, serving an additional 15 or 1600 additional newcomers. Um, and the target is to make sure that their income is at least tripled um, for each of the newcomers at the completion of their, their program with, um, uh, with Windmill. So that's the kind of thing that has the social benefit, of course, but in addition to it, we're also seeing the opportunity to connect those uh, client windmill to specialized banking services that Scotiabank has actually had for many years, newcomer banking, financial packages and advice in the bank and vice versa. When we have someone come in who's a newcomer who's looking for financial services and perhaps doesn't yet have a credit history or there's certain challenges um, you know, for getting them uh, the full range of services that they um, will eventually need, we can also refer them to Windmill in order that uh, they get the support they need through our community partner to rapidly accelerate their own um, their own uh, economic resilience within the country. So it's a win-win. No, that's, those are excellent um, initiatives. And again, they would deserve to be, uh, you know, to a proper deep dive. Uh, uh, but if I step back for a bit, so uh, there's a question from Shireen, the one and only Shireen. Thank you, Shireen. Hi. So she said, everyone, great session. Uh, okay, let's, let's be crazy, right? That's Shireen. Hey, hey. Um, so she's got a good point. Financial inclusion is nothing new, right? I mean, we, we've been talking about it for so long. So uh, uh, could you please again... <laughs> As, I, as she said, you know, do we, does it still need to be there as its own entity, um, uh, or should we have moved on and be even more specific, you know, uh, because it's still important and needs to be addressed? And again, what are the most urgent issues to tackle within that theme of financial inclusion? Uh, Laurence, do you want to start? If you're happy to answer. Uh, uh, your mic, I think. Is, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it, I think. No, you have to take care of it. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, perfect. Yes, yeah, so, so it's true. Uh, financial inclusion is, is uh, something that it's not new. Uh, I think really uh, there are some trends uh, that might um, uh, make financial inclusion e even more important. Uh, we see, of course, the, the gap of inequality that is increasing, meaning that there will be more and more uh, modest households, for instance. Uh, and we, as, a, as credit partner, we know that uh, uh, the access to consumption, uh, 
will be extremely important for uh, that part uh, of the people as well. So there are also, as far as credit is concerned, um, new trends in um, in the, the work, um, in the job, um, in the kind of job that the people have, which will be uh, less stable and so on. That can be also uh, something uh, uh, something to tackle because if we keep uh, doing the same thing as for the moment. Uh, yeah, you it mean with the gig well, economy? As well. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the consumption uh, has to change. And uh, to, uh, to, to finance and will help to make a good choice, uh, to make a reasonable and, con and sustainable choice in consumption. And, um, I think that's also an important axis to take into account in financial inclusion. Uh, we see, for instance, uh, uh, in France, uh, some of the cities do not accept uh, old vehicles anymore. And people cannot go to work if they do not have a clean uh, car. Uh, and clean cars are still expensive. So how uh, can we help the people to get access to this new car? Control? So there are a lot of friends uh, which I think uh, reinforce uh, the need for financial inclusion. In the, the, yeah. Uh, and that's a very good point. We could talk about uh, approachability or accessibility. That's one of the topics we also identified in the pre uh, pre live session briefings. Uh, so thank you, just uh, thank you, Laurence. We'll get back to you in just a sec. There's another question from Shirin. Um, but would you like to uh, offer your two cents, um, Sandra? Um, well, I, and I'm not sure if, if we should do it now, but yeah, I agree. We've been talking about financial inclusion for a long time, but, um, and this links into one of the, um, the hackathon challenges, what I'm about to say, and that is we're clearly not there yet when, um, you know, we still have like the global payday loans market, um, you know, is, is expected to reach almost $50 billion by 2030. Um, and this is, you know, payday lending where people are seeking these alternatives um, to traditional banks and, you know, they're essentially paying interest rates of around 400% plus annually if you do the math. So the fact that that is still a growing business, I think, tells us all we need to know about where we are with financial literacy and financial inclusion. Some people would say, but it's transparent. You know what you're going to get. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's an <laughs> issue, obviously. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's an incredible issue. But uh, buy now, pay later as well. It's very popular. And of course, it's not just ro all rosy. And that creates a lot of uh, potential challenges, situations as well. The subscription <laughs> economy, subscription, I mean, everything, you know, people lose, uh, sorry, lose track sometimes of uh, the, the amount of money they spend accumulatively. So those are all uh, very valid challenges. But what do you expect from the hackathon then? You mentioned that you've done an ideation session, I believe. So any specific uh, expectations? Oh, is that for me? Sandra. Sandra. Oh, okay, and then, sorry. Uh, Laurence in a sec. Uh, you, we're with you already, so. I thought yeah, sure. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I know we're, we're hoping um, the hackers will, um, will be able to delve into, um, you know, some of the questions that we, that we have um, so, you know, um, number one is, um, you know, how do we, uh, how do we address, you know, how can a traditional bank provide solution to people that might otherwise turn to payday lenders for their borrowing needs? Um, and obviously, um, so that's a, that's a big, that is the big question, um, you know, payday, uh, the people who use payday lending and, and proponents of payday lending, uh, and obviously the fact that it exists shows that it fills a legitimate gap in the marketplace. So what is within the realm of the possible for um, mainstream financial institutions to do to fill at least part of this gap um, for prospective clients? Um, how do we address the perception that payday lending is more convenient and easier to access than traditional banking? So what can we do to make, you know, to make traditional banking 
feel as convenient and easy to use for people who are not, you know, who are not comfortable with the, the way it's currently uh, delivered. And I guess last but not least, you know, how do we continue to meaningful, meaningfully build trust among, um, among uh, prospective customers, families, and communities so that they, uh, they can get to be financially stable and included in the mainstream financial economy. So these are the kinds of questions that we were, we are very excited to see how the hackers address these from a really innovative point of view. That uh, totally makes sense. Laurence, would you like to uh, share your expectations from the hackathon? Yes. Please. So we, we did a, a design thinking on budget management. So this, this is definitely a, a domain where we, we would have expectation. Uh, so really to, to have tools uh, to help people uh, keep in control of their budget, to include it really in their daily routine uh, and, uh, and prepare them to, uh, uh, to, to save for the, the future, to uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to be responsible uh, of its own finance. Yep. That's uh, one point. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's already what? Uh, I'm checking the questions. Not yet. Uh, what's the... It's not just the technology, but what's the, the potential of fintech then to help drive financial inclusion, according to you? And I'll take an example from last year, from the hackathon, we had like a, um, a fintech, one of the runner-ups, Tinch, it's an agri-fintech, agri and uh, they aim to, to tackle the bias against women in, agricultural, in the agricultural sector. And the idea was to find a way to give them access to the market pricing, to uh, loans potentially, and to lend, even lend availability. Um, so we believe, of course, technology is an enabler. Uh, do you have anything to share that in terms of potential partnerships you're considering or you've done uh, again in the in that field um, you mentioned peru as well um, sandra a bit before and i read an article not too long ago it's a year old article but about the bank of whatsapp and uh, yeah. they were talking about migrants in uh, i was in chile i believe anyway but they were talking about migrants they didn't know anybody they didn't have access to financial services and they used whatsapp to, to connect with uh, one another from the same country. And then if not, someone was in need, they would all make money and put money in a pot and basically they would lend money to each other. So that's yeah. an interesting concept as well, using mainstream technology, mainstream apps for, from migrants, for instance, um, versus using potentially a, a FinTech service targeting them. So, so what's your view on that, if you've got a view? I mean, my view is that I'm hoping the hackers help us to identify um, what is the best way to to do this. I think that in general, um, you know, you also see them in developing countries in particular and in, in Africa. And I mean, these are not places where we necessarily have business, but certainly people use their phones for a lot of their financial transactions. Um, you know, they, they don't have necessarily easy access to ATMs and, and actual physical um, bank uh, branches, but uh, a lot of banking is done, uh, as, as we know, on cell phones. So I think there's a, there's a high potential for, um, for using, um, you know, I, I think it really depends on the market. And I have to say, I don't know enough about regionally what would be more successful my my instinct would say it's going to depend on where you're doing business whether you would use a mainstream app or whether you would need to create a, something particular for the um the product services and advice that you're trying to deliver i think it depends what market you're in and um so, certainly yeah it's a it's a really interesting concept uh, and you we touched something imp interesting as well. When we always say that 1.6 billion people are unbanked worldwide, we also say two thirds of them have, have got a smartphone, right? But we also touched another challenge, which is to, to drive, to successfully drive the adoption of mobile money in developing countries, because a lot of people are still concerned. There's everybody, a lot of people have a smartphone, but there's low usage of mobile money in lots of those countries. 
because they don't have maybe trust in the governments and the corporates. Maybe there's a data privacy and security concern. So again, there's potential, right? But there's still barriers actually uh, to overcome to really drive that at scale. But, uh, but it feels like because the mobile phone is so, uh, so ubiquitous and, you know, so well, um, everybody's got one almost kind of. It seems like ob obviously that's an obvious channel to help drive financial inclusion. Um, Sorry, um, did you want to add anything on that topic, Laurence, or not really on the technology side yet? You're on mute. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, uh, to, I think, uh, with the agility of fintechs and so on, better understand how to be closer uh, to the needs of the of the consumer and really uh, in the daily routine how, how we can uh, yes, better understand and help them. And you talk about, uh, we talk about user experience, uh, we talk yes. about financial wellness mm -hmm. as well, because that's an important topic, right? How do you deliver the right insights at the right moment in time on the right channel uh, with the right level of information? So uh, how to be useful, right? And to be trusted, we still go back to that. But one element as well, we don't have time probably to touch, but uh, there's at least two types of uh, two key themes from the hackathon which are important in that case and could drive financial inclusion. One is embedded finance, because now any brand, or tomorrow, every brand is a fintech, right? Uh, tomorrow, like famous, well-known, trusted brands will or already are, are providing, you know, some um, financial services, financial products within the experience at the point of sale, for instance. So that could be one way, of course, to somehow drive financial inclusion for specific use cases. And the other one is decentralized finance. We had a, a great chat about trade finance, the trade finance gap recently, and the potential of decentralized finance to give small, micro, medium enterprises access to liquidity pools, despite not having collaterals. And oh, I mean, all that uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating challenges from that, that area of, of financial services. So, and decentralized finance, is it, um, do you have already some kind of views on that or the potential, or you, you'd rather not say it's still a bit in the grand scheme of things, kind of young, um, or you, you, you started to explore that, that potential? Well, I'm, I can say about decentralized finance, if you're talking about Bitcoin and crypto, all I can say is, Someday when I'm on holiday, I'm going to sit down and uh, hit the books and try to understand how this works. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, someday I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be investing in crypto on a beach somewhere lovely. I don't know about uh, that. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm one of those people who's like, I, whenever I think I understand it, I'm like, mm, maybe I don't understand this. So I do not have a point of view on decentralized finance other than to say, uh, need to uh, get somebody to explain it. Um, no, 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 and enough, enough. Uh, study it more carefully. I don't know, Laurence, if you've uh, if you've mastered this one, but boy, I have. I thought, I thought Laurence is the expert at BNP Paribas about anything Bitcoin related. That's, Bitcoin that's the rumor I've heard, but I'm like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, no but uh, that's that's on my list as well. But uh, as as Santa, I think we we have to to get a little bit uh, more. Uh, used to it and understand it better and so on. But for sure, it it, it is necessary. And, uh, we are in an exploratory exploratory mode, as uh, as you mentioned for the for the moment. Yeah. So so yeah. you're right. The Bitcoin. I mean, the crypto is one thing. The smart contracts, the DLT, the decentralized autonomous organizations. I mean, all those types of entities. Yeah, it is. For, yeah. Sure, for sure, there will be uh, opportunities for uh, for the, the clients, for, for the partners, for uh, us as well. But we have to we have a good assessment of, uh, of the risk as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, coming back to the the notion of trust that uh, that we can have as financial institutions. So uh, uh, there will be something, I think, um, but to be better understood and better handled, I think. I, I just I just want to add one thing that please, please. there are certainly a number of um, other people in, in our bank who are indeed experts on this, I, just to be clear. Um, when I say that, boy, I need to figure this out, that's a personal um, response to your question on this panel, but uh, there are lots of people in uh, certainly in our bank who 
um, are looking very carefully at this and understand it quite well. They just don't have to be on this band. <laughs> exactly the same for me. <laughs> we're sure of it. We're sure of it. No problem. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But uh, we, um, it's almost time. Uh, Sharon's got another question, actually, which I think is good to be one of the final questions, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Where do I can put it on? Where do you want uh, the topic? So this conversation we took financial inclusion. Can you can you project yourself in the next couple of years if you can achieve what it is you'd like to achieve? Where will we be then in two years' time? If you can answer that or give us some again a glimpse of how the future would look like if you manage to achieve what you'd like to achieve in the next two years. Or is it too vague or uh, it's hard to predict, of course, granted. But, uh, well, from uh, from my side, uh, I hope that we will uh, uh, have been able to um, to help the, the, the people, the more modest people, uh, even more than the share system that we have now. Uh, that we have uh, uh, been able to give solution to, to the youngsters, to uh, uh, to the self-employed, uh, uh, etc., to, to better manage their budgets to uh, uh, to realize their, their projects uh, to have helped them to get access uh, to the job market or to the education uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, that's already a lot uh, it is a fair amount but uh, to, to, to prove that we made it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, um, that's yeah, that's that's commendable. I hope actually we can have that conversation in two years' time, and uh, you'll be able to demonstrate the huge impact uh, mm. we collectively made. Yeah, so yeah, thank you, Laurence. Uh, we're doing carefully, yeah, uh, looking at yes. the over indebtedness as as well. Huh? So, yeah. No, no, of course. And, so, the, the right and again, we touch the surface. There's so many other, of course, layers, angles, complexity, uh, regulation, uh, various entities driving all those topics from. Uh, education to collaboration. Uh, Sandra, did you want to try to answer that or tell <laughs> us again your view? Yeah, of course. You wish? Um, yeah, I think um, what I would love to see in the next couple of years is uh, I think it starts with making sure that um, we have a very clear understanding of how traditional banks um, can provide borrowing solutions for people who might otherwise turn to, to um, Alt very high interest and expensive alternatives such as payday lenders. Um, I think we need to, uh, and what I really would like to see is um, an increased ability, likely in partnership with community organization government, and it may be across um, a number of different banks coordinating and collaborating on these solutions, but it would be really great to see um, traditional financial service providers uh, be able to uh, serve a larger portion of the market that is currently um, using these very um, high interest sources of financing. I, I'd like to see us be able to serve more of those people. Okay. Again, it's a commendable uh, objective, so hopefully uh, that will happen in the next couple of years. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, it's been a great, uh, great conversation. It's a fascinating topic. It's extremely important, obviously. Um, and and we've covered just a fraction of it. Uh, we didn't talk too much about SMEs or a bit of about entrepreneurship. We could have talked about pensioners or retirees or uh, and uh, anything in between in terms of uh, market segments. So again, a huge topic. Uh, thank you again to all of you for watching. And if you watch live again. Uh, Feel free uh, to check uh, the hackathon, so dev, um, fintech.devpost.com. If you're watching on demand, again, please feel free to check Finastra Hack to the Future, to check all the great content we produced over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, thank you to our wonderful guests, of course, Sandra and Laurent. So, uh, merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Um, and the call to actions, just, you know, just a couple. Or maybe more depending on you uh, my guests the one uh, is just to start up a conversation so please we invite you to to connect connect online possibly linkedin i hope that's something you're happy to do uh, sandra or laurence ashram so please feel free to do that if you're watching the video live again please register now you still have a few days to uh, participate to the hackathon uh, is there a last thing you'd like to cover or share 
Sandra, or a call to action going and checking mm -hmm. a report or anything in particular from Scotia Bank? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, yeah, I would say um, I would encourage people to please take a look at our 2021 ESG report, which we just posted two weeks ago um, online. And um, uh, there's a, a, a whole section on sustainable finance, as well as um, social impact, including financial inclusion and partnerships uh, that help to drive uh, positive social change within financial services. So I uh, would encourage anyone who's um, interested to see what we're up to, to please take a look at that. Thank you. So yeah, please do that. We can find that on Google and or browsing your website, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Laurence? So yeah, I just would like to, uh, to thank you very much for uh, this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, as I will be a member of the jury uh, at the end of the hackathon, I can't wait to see uh, all the ideas and uh, the initiatives that will uh, come up. I'm very impatient. <laughs> Is it oh. me or, sorry? <laughs> is it one of you or is it me? Is it you? No. Oh, no. My God, it's me. I'm so sorry. Uh, well, thank you very much. Perfect timing. The dog is uh, a bit restless now. Um, now I just have to say thank you again, everybody, and uh, see you soon online. And thank you again, our, our brilliant guests. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Join Finastra for its global hackathon and be part of the movement. Welcome to Hack to the Future 4. Connect with our global community to learn about decentralized finance. Discover how to build a better future with sustainable and inclusive finance. And learn how to scale up with banking as a service and embedded finance. Win prizes from Finastra and our partners to help you continue your fintech journey. Register now at fintech.devpost.com.